Um, once again, uh, good morning, colleagues, and welcome to today's workshop. I noticed that there are now 25 of us who have logged in. Um, there are more than 30 people who registered for this webinar, and I'm sure some of them will be joining as we get along. Um, I would like to, my name is Ephraim Mshanga. I'm part of the Siapumilela team at Saide. And I'm standing in for my colleague, Merela, who unfortunately has not been able to attend due to uh, circumstances be beyond her control. Um, I will be just making introductory remarks and then I will hand over to the facilitator of the workshop. This is um, the workshop on data-informed approach to module reviews. And it's one of the key national workshops that will be of Siapomelela national workshops that will be run in 2022. As I said, it was quite impressive to see that over 30 participants had registered for the workshop. And I think they were representing at least six universities. I want to believe that uh, those that haven't yet joined will be joining shortly. Uh, let me introduce you to the facilitator of the webinar, Dr. Joanne Claude Lemons from the University of Pretoria. Joanne is the head of higher education and research and innovation at the University of Pretoria. And he, he has been participating in Siapumelela right from the beginning. University of Pretoria was one of the um, key universities to start the Siapumelela project when it started. And they were a participant institution and John Claude was playing a very central role in that project. He, I remember he presenting, making fabulous presentations that were highly insightful at several of our Siapumelela conferences. You will explain the format of uh, today's webinar. And I understand that it will just be a webinar with no breakaway rooms, no parallel sessions, but obviously there will be uh, opportunities for people to comment, uh, to ask questions and to share their thoughts. So um, I hope you will have a very enriching experience through the webinar. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Jean will provide an overview of how the whole session will unfold. So yes, please feel free to ask any questions that you may have. I would like to remind all of you to complete a short evaluation form at the end of the webinar. It is very useful that you do so because we value the feedback you give us through that evaluation form. The information is used for improving how we plan these webinars in future. The link was uh, sent to everyone through an email by Marilla, but um, my colleague Elias, who will be sitting through this uh, webinar, will paste the link once again in the chat space towards the end of um, the webinar. Let me also uh, let you know that the whole webinar session will be recorded and the recording will be uploaded on the Siapumelela YouTube channel so that if anyone is interested in accessing it again, they can easily do so. So thank you very much. Um, let me, I would have liked to sit through the whole uh, webinar session, but unfortunately I have another workshop that will be running concurrently with this one. So within the next few minutes, I will be leaving for that workshop. Let me hand you over to Dr. Juan Claude Hemens so that he can say a few more words about himself and also possibly provide an overview 
of how today's session will unfold. Over to you, Juan. Thank you very much, Efron. Thank you for the introduction. Um, and also to Elias for the technical side um, on supporting me with uh, setting up. Um, thank you again for Sadie for providing this platform. Um, and as you said, the University of Pretoria has uh, been involved with Sadie for, for many years and with the inception of the Siapu Madela project. And we still play a sort of a keen role at the back end. And uh, we are really delighted to be able to do this presentation this morning um, on the work that we actually do at the University of Pretoria. So it's actually uh, a big honor for us to share what we do with uh, specifically a module reviews um, or course analytics or module analytics depends on how you actually want to phrase it. Um, so in terms of this morning, uh, it's the presentation. Um, we will, let me just do the going over the, in terms of an overview of the presentation, we will look at what learning analytics is, basically just the sort of default definition, and then look at the purpose and benefits of course analytics or module reviews as we see it from the University of Pretoria's perspective, and then go into um, the course analytics framework that we've developed, and I'll spend some time on that. Then module review process, the process that we at the University of Pretoria follow, as well as the selection criteria, and then spend some time on the module review survey, and then data analytics that we use for decision-making, and then closing that review loop, if you like, with something um, like a, a design approach. So that's how the morning is going to unfold. Uh, there where you see that line, that dotted line is where we will probably have a, a 10, 15 minute break. I'm, I wouldn't be able to go through the full three hours without the break. So I'm not going to expect that from you either. So we're going to take a short break there, maybe 15 to 20 minutes. It should be around about uh, just after 10 o'clock, at uh, 10.30, somewhere there. Um, so as um, Ephraim said, with the, it's sort of a, something between a webinar and a workshop. Um, and I will allow uh, at certain points where we can have a discussion around uh, some aspects which I've highlighted, but please feel free to stop me in between if you want to ask questions and maybe have some brilliant idea uh, that you might have. So it's, I would like to invite you to have a sort of an open discussion around this. I'm not coming as the sage on the stage with every, um, with all the knowledge to this uh, webinar. I'm just sharing how we are doing it and uh, you might have some other idea of what you think might work better in your context. And, and you please share that, feel free to share your opinion on that as well. I'm also gonna put off um, the video. It, it pulls quite a lot of data, but also I'm, I think to work with my hands and as you can see, it's going to be very distracting. Um, so as I go on, I'm going to now just switch off my video and then we can continue with, uh, the, with the webinar uh, or the workshop, whatever, a hybrid thing. All right, so here goes my video. All right, so colleagues, um, the default, as we all know it, what learning analytics is, this is the, very first definition, it's still the de facto definition of what learning analytics is. And uh, let me read it out loud. Learning analytics is the measurement, collection, analysis, and reporting of data about learners and their context for the purpose of understanding and optimizing learning and the environment in which it occurs. So you might wonder, Okay, so why are we looking at the definition of learning analytics per se? And well, when I started developing this uh, course, uh, this is a, the third unit in a, 
in a four part um, course that I'm preparing uh, mainly for lecturers to do. Um, learning analytics is sort of the base of what we're trying to do with module reviews or course or module analytics. And is looking at the context, the module as the context in which these learners operate, as well as where the, the lecturers have to provide and facilitate the learning through the teaching, the assessment, the way the curriculum is um, set up and so forth to optimize that learning in order for students to be successful. So that's why we've got as the base of the module reviews, this definition of learning analytics. Obviously throughout the years, this was developed in 2010 by Long and Siemens. It was also the inception of the Learning Analytics and Knowledge Conference and the SOLAR community, Society for Learning Analytics Research. And it has developed over time, but this still remains the base of what learning analytics is. And various streams have come out of this where uh, course analytics is, is one of those. So if we look at the purpose from the University of Pretoria's perspective, and what I did here was rely quite heavily on, uh, apart from the learning analytics and what that means in terms of bringing data and so forth, but also in terms of what quality means from the Council on Higher Education's perspective. So it is to improve the quality of teaching learning and assessment. So I can see that as uh, the, the context in which we want to apply the course uh, analytics. So improving teaching and learning with that resource from the Council on Higher Education, the ITL resource it is on the website and I am providing at the end uh, the resource um, or the resources. So if you look at an institutional level, you want to look at the uh, institution-wide quality management systems in which this effectiveness of the institution's academic provision is monitored and approved, uh, improved. So if you think about it, uh, in many instances, universities have a quality office where this at, a, at an institutional level is managed. So that's sorted to a large extent where you have program reviews and the CHE is in the process at the back end or actually maybe at the beginning uh, of the institutional uh, evaluations. But module reviews take it one step lower. So at a more micro level uh, where um, in this ITL resource, it talks about uh, that the institution needs to provide resources, processes and procedures for internal reviews. And that's of modules and also they refer there to programs and a self-evaluation to assist higher education to develop quality management systems that are likely to improve teaching and learning. Now, the, the program evaluations that the CHE does and the quality office normally does is usually at the summit of the level towards the end or maybe after a number of years, whereas the review of courses should actually be done while the course is being taught. So starting planning before the module is actually um, presented in that specific year. And then um, at the beginning, start looking at what are the things that one needs to look at. And that is what I'm going to share with you, this process that we follow in order to run these type of reviews. Um, so the purpose is also through this ITL resource is that uh, the, the purpose is to uh, look at gaps while students still, well, while they're in the module and while the lecturer still has the opportunity to make changes in order to improve uh, quality, but also change teaching design and maybe improve learning as well as outcomes such as module success rates. And then it also states that these internal review of courses are fundamental to improving also the quality of the curriculum. So it's not only in terms of its micro level at the module level, but improving that has an effect on the whole system. So as in, in the case of the program curricula. Right, so that's just 
um, how um, I've approached this in terms of setting up the module reviews at the University of Pretoria. Um, so obviously there are many benefits. These are just some of the benefits. Um, from an analytics perspective, uh, you're able to do so much. Um, uh, the opportunities are quite vast in terms of what you can do. So conversation analytics as tech. So look at these social networks analysis on your learning management systems, these blogs and so on that students use or the way that lecturers have set that up in order to facilitate discussion between students and um, peers on certain topics. That's a type of analytics that you can look at uh, and see to what extent students are engaged in the module, who are the key role players in terms of students in those modules, and maybe assign them certain roles to, to uh, get students in to the module and to um, improve uh, engagement in that way. Psychosocial aspects, so looking more at the effective side, motivation and self-efficacy are key indicators uh, when one looks at learning analytics. Um, the metacognitive side is another um, uh, source of information and analytics that you really want to do. The self-regulation, knowledge of cognition, regulation of cognition, that's type of information that one would get with qualitative data, such as surveys and so forth. Engagement and involvement, so looking at time on tasks, uh, uploading of uh, data or assignments, so not data, but assignments specifically. And then uh, computational psychometrics is this intersection between education, learning and assessment and determining to what extent the students' ability or the range of student ability and the range of item difficulty or question difficulty are aligned. And in order to maximize uh, the way that the assessment actually measures the competencies or the knowledge or the skills that you actually want to measure. Um, and that there's a progression in terms of, let's say, difficulty, not only within the test, but over test and test periods. Then the multimodal learning analytics. This is a, a new field which is immersing at the moment uh, in Europe as well as in um, uh, the US and so on. There's eye tracking, so putting sensors on students, uh, seeing where they navigate their eyes and what is important and where do you actually want them to, to navigate in and on uh, a learning management system. Uh, something which is also relatively effective or they're testing the effectiveness, so to speak, in terms of medical uh, training and so on. And obviously, um, there are benefits at the instructor level. I'm not talking about the student level here, but at the instructor level, because that's going to be your target audience. Maybe I should also just step back quickly and say the, the purpose of this is as I am uh, a researcher in uh, CTL, Center for Teaching and Learning. You want to facilitate, so I'm the facilitator to help uh, the, the lecturers. And that's the, how this uh, webinar has been set up. I'm here to support you in terms of doing this as a facilitator in, um, in a module and with a group of lecturers. So you really want to share the benefits um, of this type of module review at an instructor level. So it allows instructors to determine weaknesses in students' learning and comprehension, and to determine that within the module's curriculum. So looking at the design within the, in the module, so talking to the module's curriculum, um, looking at student interaction, changing students' learning behavior, um, and then also looking at the pedagogical approaches that one can change given information that was um, provided through the analytics. Learning analytics allows instructors to identify students at risk and in order to intervene at an early enough time to improve their performance and then hopefully improve retention and student success rates and so forth. All right. So in looking at these benefits, when we started with um, the module reviews, we called it, we focused on the high impact modules and I'm going to refer to that a, a bit later. 
but there was no, we had no real framework in which we wanted to, um, to conduct these module reviews. Obviously, there's learning, uh, a, a lot of literature in terms of learning analytics, and later uh, various frameworks started to emerge, and that literature um, became the base for how should we approach, what are the components that we need to look at when we do these type of module reviews in the frame of a course analytics or learning analytics. So one of the very early conceptual frameworks for analytics and higher education was this one from Van Barenveld, Arnold and Campbell in 2012. And you can see how they've sort of positioned learning analytics within uh, the, the faculty level. So within the academic area, whereas academic analytics at the top is your typical reporting. It's the things that institutional researchers do. There's a reporting internally to faculties in terms of very high level key performance indicators. But then there's also the reporting to um, uh, government and so on, Can, uh, Council on Higher Education, uh, um, the Department of Higher Education and Training and so forth. But at the learning analytics side, it was not quite clear while well, they started to think about, so how do we position this? And you can see here that the learning analytics is within the department level, and there was a strong link to the scholarship of teaching and learning. And a very sort of um, linear flow from the academic analytics, then it goes into the faculty and department where the scholarship of teaching and learning takes place and how that information can be used through the scholarship cycles, the action inquiry framework a type of cycles. And then based on that information, somebody would be able to do predictive analytics, there's action analytics and decision making. So a very linear approach uh, starting off with, but a good conceptual framework of where this learning, this notion of uh, or concept of learning analytics actually fits in. Um, and you are welcome to read the, the article in terms of how they've approached this. Um, a, a very recent uh, article is the uh, one from Van Fieren from uh, University of the Free State. And uh, she actually provided a, a bit more detail in terms of providing a, a, a framework for uh, higher education analytics. The, the framework, and I'm only showing parts of it at the top where you can't see, is where she's actually brought in the, the actual framework in terms of uh, analytics, the two legs, basically academic analytics and learning analytics on the side, there's the student pipeline. So it's a notion of looking at students through a process of coming in to the university. So this is at the university level, and then going through uh, year one, year two, year three as a, as a pathway, and then looking at the resources and the graduate attributes and so on. And where you can start seeing teaching analytics is where this has been sort of slotted on to the framework of analytics and where the, the lecturer is brought in to a notion which he calls teaching analytics and where the lecturer is then responsible for looking at the curriculum, and that is the whole teaching and learning uh, design. And uh, apart from that is the assessment, developing graduate attributes and stakeholder involvement. Once that has been done within um, the lecturer's environment, then it goes into bringing in a sort of a bigger group where you look at the teaching engagement with own module specific um, uh, data. And there's this sort of process of evaluating and critical review and reflection and professional development has been linked to that. Now, it, it was helpful in terms of setting up a framework for the University of Pretoria, but I would see this more as sort of a process map. After you've got the data, there's this process which a lecturer does and follows in order to get to the teaching excellence and improve student success and, and experience and so forth. So um, 
these sort of frameworks and other literature became the base for the course analytic framework, which I developed for the University of Pretoria. I shared this last year at the um, Flexible Futures Conference that we had at the University of Pretoria. And I've actually elaborated on that a bit more for uh, the workshops that we're doing as well as for this one. So at a very high level, you can see the, the various components, learning theory at the top end. We are advocating that course analytics has to be done and any analytics for that matter within a learning theory. Um, the lecturer context, the student context plays a big role. And then at the bottom, the base, the policies, the practices and the processes of the institution, uh, but also within the faculty and the department and within the module play a big role. Um, so, and then within that is this intentional inquiry into learning and teaching and assessment practices, which is typically your scholarship of teaching and learning with an action inquiry framework at the top of that. The quality management systems for module review, you can hear the ITL resource from the CHE there. And then the notion of humanizing learning analytics. So bringing in the lecturer and the students with their context into designing the, the analytics and the approach and the review that you're going to do. Trusted learning analytics and ethics is also a concept which is funded very highly within the uh, European environment, where we need to bring in data uh, that is, as they call, call it, a, a white box, in as opposed to this black box where we don't know what data has gone into it, what informs uh, your predictions, for instance, uh, the, the models. Those must be upfront, they need to be clear, we need to understand uh, what are the predictors of success, to what extent are they predictors and under what context and uh, situations are they actually worth um, using. So that's this trusted learning analytics. Then the fusion of analytics to improve productivity, innovation and performance within this environment of a quality action. And then a holistic view that incorporates the students, the lecturers, the policies, the practices, and the processes. And then grounded in learning, a uh, grounding learning analytics in educational theory. So this is at a broad level, the course analytics framework that, um, that we're proposing at the University of Pretoria. So looking at some of these in a bit more detail. Um, so the scholarship of Teaching and learning is this intentional inquiry into learning, teaching and assessment practices, and to enhance those practices to improve learning. So if we look at the principles of scholarship of teaching and learning, it's about practice development, curriculum enhancement and student uh, learning. Uh, this notion of uh, dissemination and impact uh, where it seeks to review and critique where there's a community where people share knowledge, there's an interaction, um, there's uh, a look at the uh, policies and the practices that emerge. And that's typically what we've done at the university uh, through the module reviews pre-COVID mostly, where we bring in the group of lecturers that teach a module. That includes uh, people from uh, our Center for Teaching and Learning, the education consultants and the instructional designers, uh, where you uh, bring in uh, other uh, role players, such as um, the survey office and so on, uh, the students' uh, voice. So it could include uh, focus group discussions and so on. And then, um, the SOTL is also associated with change and boundary crossing. So that's at the base. At the top of that, um, you bring in an applied inquiry framework, linking the research to action. So there is this notion of a continuous cycle of data collection, data analysis, data feedback, action plan, and then going on to the data collection cycle. Um, and that's typically what you want to bring in. So it's, it's never, there is a closing of the loop as we have it here on a theoretical, maybe a practical level, but you want to 
continue with the improvement cycle. In order to do that, you need to go into this inquiry framework. And then obviously data informed action plans. The next uh, leg is this improved teaching and learning and the quality action. Um, again, it's from the quality perspective and the, obviously the CHP's perspective, the achievement and enhancement of curriculum quality through the module review. Learning, um, it should also be seen as a learning opportunity for academic staff and an opportunity to understand and reflect on their teaching practices and that what consequence that has for learning. Um, it's also, uh, should also create a space to articulate the educational rationale, the uh, learning theories and how that underpins their practice. And then this intentional um, idea to observe the impact of teaching and what it has on learning and to reflect on what the findings mean for the improvement of their own practice. And then the quality action would be plans for improvement and the implementation of those plans. And then lastly, the, um, the analytics in education, referring to both the learning analytics and the uh, data analytics, traditional data analytics. Okay, so learning analytics here centers on the learning process and it should be linked to the teaching design and assessment strategies. You'll see me uh, focusing quite a, a, a lot on that when we get to the data side. Sound theoretical framework about what uh, we're trying to measure. So you need to understand what is being measured from a, a uh, learning theory perspective. So as we are in the advent of big data, uh, uh, big data is uh, from an educational perspective uh, to be debatable, uh, or do we really have that big data? But nonetheless, as you start getting more data into your modules, the likelihood of things being highly correlated, being significant increases. And to, um, to a large extent, almost anything can be correlated with everything. And if you do not have a learning theory, a sound theoretical framework, um, you would not be able to interpret um, what you're actually uh, seeing through the data and uh, not be able to make sound judgments and uh, uh, implement action plans. And also then to incorporate solutions that support curriculum design, student feedback, language proficiency assessments and so on. So it's also bringing in additional information. Then on the action analytics side, analytics must be actionable within those theoretical or learning theories uh, and the constructs that you're actually measuring. Okay, colleagues, so that's basically what is sort of informing the way that we approach uh, our uh, learning analytics at the University of Pretoria. I'm going to move over to the process that we've been following at the University of Pretoria um, in order to do this reviews. But I'm going to step one, one step back in sort of give you a bit of a background of where we've been where and how we've placed this so that you can have an idea of how to approach this at your institution. Just come take a sip of tea. So as part of the Seattle Malela project, we established a student success committee quite uh, early. So when we started, I think 2015, one of our first points were to establish the student success committee. It's now called the SEBI Data Analytics Committee and I'm the chair of that committee. On that, we have the various uh, deputy deans for teaching and learning. And in some cases, uh, deputy deans for research on there. And then we have the various directors and deputy directors of um, the support departments that are responsible for some kind of um, aspect <clears throat> that relate to student success. 
so that's the committee where we make these and make use of data to improve student success. One of the initiatives was this high impact module project where we would look at um, modules which have a, uh, a certain uh, criteria and I'm going to discuss that in the next slide and based on that criteria we would then invite the lecturers to be part of the module review. This was mostly facilitated through the HODs, the head of departments, although it was sort of oversight by, overseen by the deputy dean of uh, teaching and learning. Right, so uh, from this, I would then go in and um, uh, send this in, in, uh, invitation through the office of the deputy dean to the, uh, to the lecturers of the specific modules that we've identified. Um, I'm going to sort of share two ideas, um, well, not two ideas, two uh, approaches that we had. The one was pre-COVID and the other one was post or in COVID, if you like. So the one was a, we invite the lecturers and the lecturing team to an office and we had a meeting. The other one was just doing exactly the same, but online. Um, if you, if I would have it, I would have the in-person um, way of uh, doing these type of evaluations. But nonetheless, so what I would then do is invite um, the faculty. So we would invite the lecturers, the HOD and the deputy deans to the Microsoft Teams platform. And I'm going to show you that now. Then we would also invite the uh, staff from the Center for Teaching and Learning notably the education consultants, which provide support on the teaching and learning side, and then the instructional designers providing support on the e-learning side. So it is the learning management um, platform, but also uh, setting up uh, various uh, resources within the learning management system. Then we have a module self-evaluation report or a module review report. Um, this is a survey that I have. In 2019, when we had the uh, in situ discussion where we were in person, um, we didn't have the survey. We had the questions and we had a discussion with the lecturing team as well as our team from CTL. And we discussed these points and we had a, a, a good, a chat around the various components. Um, whereas with the, with the uh, in COVID situation, I would send that survey to the um, lecturing team and they could complete the survey before we had an online discussion. And then during that this online discussion, we would just add additional notes and so on to the, to the questions. Right, then I would then upload that to the BI system or the um, LMS or the teams. Then we would have action items and identify the areas where the Department of Education Innovation, as we have at CTL, would support the, uh, the lecturers and the lecturing team. I would also have uh, uh, data around uh, historical data, and that I'm going to show learning management data, and then also set up, if necessary, the retention center. I'm quickly gonna show that also, just the screen of that. And the, towards the end, uh, where the lecturing team evaluates the module intervention and outcomes, and then reporting to the deputy dean, HOD and deputy dean at the end of the semester, and then, um, for high, high impact modules, we would have feedback at the TSEBI committee. So we would also, I would also do a summary of the information and present that at our student success committee, where those are cross, cross cutting issues, um, as well as issues that have uh, impact on the, and on the university's policies or practices or processes. All right. Let me show you what the Microsoft Teams uh, area looks like. This is a, um, let me just see where it's going to share. 
And if you are able to see it, I'm going to take this to the screen. So you should be able to see um, the Microsoft Teams interface. Am I correct? I can just get a yay or a nay. Yes, we can see. Thank you. All right. So what I've done is this is um, just the Microsoft Teams uh, professional learning community um, uh, workbook and uh, with all the other workbooks that I have. This is the, the template that I provide. If I can just quickly go here, you can see I've got a whole list of various faculties that um, we uh, do this, but this is the template that I work Sorry, from. Sorry, Joan. Yes. I, I cannot see what we have shared on the, on the screen. You cannot see it? Yes. Okay. I'm just going to stop sharing quickly, and then I'm going to reshare. That should sort it out. Um, is it visible now? I think it's in terms of the font size. Oh, in terms of the font size. Better now? Better for me now. Okay, thank you. It's, it's um, just an example. It, this is basically how we've set up the various files. So within this, we could upload uh, data or any files or folders or whatever. So it depends on how you want to set up the, um, this workbook where, and this is a workbook for each module that we are going to do a module review in. All right. Then I've set up the, um, the, the area where we, are, where we have our discussion and with all the information that is going to be important. So you can see here on the, um, on the pane where we have the module review. I've actually, um, it was a bit more elaborate. I've streamlined it to have this single page where we have the module review, which looks at review, plan, do, and check. Those are the things that we want to do from the start and set up um, the whole uh, interface so that we can have this in a single page. Then we have a background, which just gives us and, uh, and the, the lecturing team some information about what this is. What are we doing with this module review? And you can see the uh, similar to the slide that I showed, uh, but just more in detail for our purposes. And then I'm going to look at that criteria just now. And then there's a reflection area where we want the lecturers to reflect on what we've been doing um, from the module review perspective, but I'm going to show you a bit more detailed approach. Is there a comment or a question? Okay. Uh, if you can just uh, unmute yourself, if you do not want to ask a question, please. All right. And then resources is basically the resources from the uh, Microsoft team. So it tells you what is a PLC, professional learning community. It's just an area where professionals can share what we want to do, like we intend with the module reviews. Okay. So this is basically how we've set it up. And uh, it, when we have a discussion, so here's a link to the survey. And I'm going to show you the survey just now, but we have that available in this module review work. Then we have the various aspects, the questions. And I'm not going to focus on the questions now because we're going to look at them in detail just now. Um, so when we have a discussion, we can look at these and we can have discussion notes around these points that we want to look at. Then we have the action items. So based on our discussion, based on the questions that we want to look at, this is a default set of action items or things that our education consultants can support you with. Then we assign that, we assign due dates, and we just want to make sure, yes, it has been done. 
so that we can report back to the HOD and we can report back to the deputy dean, yes, this was completed. This is what we wanted to do. And this is the person responsible and this is the due date and it has been done or it hasn't been done. And this is what we do for each of the components or constructs that we want to look at. We're going to focus on that just now, but this is how I've set it up. Um, all right, then we've got the survey solution there. I'm going to focus on that uh, just now on the uh, survey. I'm going to flick back to the, um, to the presentation now. And you should be able to see this then, right, which is the, the presentation. Yes. Yes, thank you. Then we are going to focus on the criteria. Obviously, you would not be able to do module reviews for all modules across the campus every single year. So we've set up criteria to look at high impact modules. Now, a high impact module has two criteria. Well, it basically has one criteria and it is students uh, or modules with a pass rate less than 75%. Then we decided, okay, so we're going to break that up. See, that's a target group module with a pass rate below 75%. We're gonna break it up in two categories, medium touch and high touch. Don't ask me why I chose that terminology, but um, at a high touch means we're going to spend a bit more uh, effort or a bit more processes, a bit more whatever on that because it needs a bit more attention. That's probably why high touch. All right, so we decided we're going to look at uh, modules with the enrollment greater than 500. So I'm on the red bar now. Now the argument for looking at enrollments above 500, these modules are typically modules that um, are service modules to students from other programs and students from other faculties. So if students perform uh, on average poorly within this module that has a low success rate. It means it's going to impact students from many programs and also across faculties. That's why high touch. And then we have various interventions. And this is typically the interventions where we're going to do a module review. We're going to uh, have a, a, a team assigned to the modules. We're going to provide additional information there is support from the ECs and the education consultants and the instructional designers, a very, uh, and a very targeted approach. The medium touch, this gold, yellow, whatever bar, is um, enrollments below 500. So it tends to be modules that are within a uh, single program, maybe two or three programs at most, but they just have high student numbers, but uh, the important part there is that it is a low pass rate. And there we would provide, um, you could do the module review, but then we would typically uh, provide you with a survey instead of a, a, a discussion. So there would be the survey, that survey is then discussed between the module teaching team and an HOD, and then that, uh, based on that discussion between those parties, there would then be negotiated support from our instructional um, designers as well as our um, education consultants. So you can see here, it's a bit more a low key um, approach, but still there is this process of um, a module self review. And then obviously the low touch are all the rest of the modules that are actually performing well and they are okay to continue. So this is now where I open up the floor and maybe uh, get some feedback um, from you. And uh, what criteria would you use at your institution um, to, to select 
um, modules for a review. So you're welcome to raise your hand or is there a raise hand function here or just uh, unmute yourself and maybe share what you think would be criteria to be, to be used at your institution. We can spend about five minutes on that. So maybe one or two people that want to just share uh, from your perspective. Uh, Linda, Jay, no, Vanessa Brown. Yeah. So let's go, Linda, Jay, yes. Uh, hi, uh, Linda Jackson from the yeah. Quality Unit at Nelson Mandela University. We have done the service module reviews and we decided to do them, obviously, as you've said, they're often service modules, but they service a wide range of programs and faculties. And it was very interesting to interact with the lecturers that offer those programs because they have different issues and constraints to a lecturer that would be lecturing a set subject in a discipline. So we also found that it, it required a different approach and a, a different understanding from doing a program review because we would normally do program reviews and we would look at the modules within a program but this is a module within many programs. So it, it required a different approach. So that's what we've actually only done is the high risk group. Thanks. Okay, thank you for that feedback, uh, great. Um, I see uh, another hand, Vanessa Brown, UWC. Uh, yes, uh, good morning. I, I just wanted to share another uh, criteria that we are exploring is the notion of the modules most failed um, by students who, who drop out or experience delayed completion because they don't neatly fit um, um, the, the criteria that we have generally used, which is the size, the pass rate um, offered in multiple programs. So it could be modules with small enrollment um, and, uh, and um, yeah, with a small enrollment offered in one program perhaps, but they are most failed by students who drop out and often um, these are prerequisites, for example, and present bottlenecks. So um, it's just trying to uh, include a criteria, uh, you know, that's, that's not necessarily related to size, although those are very important, but also um, the, the modules most failed. Thanks for that. Um, do, do lecturers have the opportunity to self-select their modules for a review in your institution? Both Vanessa and Linda, you are welcome to respond. Well, we, we don't have um, a sophisticated process in place yet. So it is simply part of our um, regular departmental reviews. Um, but yeah, I mean, what you're presenting um, we don't have the capacity for at the moment, but it is something we are planning for now. So there's no self-selection. Um, there's a lot of conversation about what these modules are and um, within the two departmental review and the program review, um, they are addressed, but we, we haven't had uh, the separate course reviews that are centrally arranged. They've been uh, delegated to the faculties. Thanks for that. Linda, would you like to respond? Uh, yes, thanks. So the reason or the motivation for us to look at the service models was that they almost fall into a gray area. So when we would do a program review, we would look at all the module files and we would find that very often the service modules, as, as Vanessa said, are a bottleneck and the department that's running the program doesn't feel they have ownership to reach across to someone else in another faculty offering them a service module. And we found it very difficult. I think initially even the professional body accreditation programs found it difficult to get someone who's offering a service module to understand the contribution that their program or their module has to the overall program. And so we looked into that 
as a way of almost offering support to these service module providers who end up with very large classes and are not always, their staff-student ratio is not always ideal. In fact, it's sometimes quite horrific. And the importance that the program has on the fact that the students will pass, because often they're in the first year, they're foundation modules, and the students are required to have the grasp of what they're learning in order to continue. And so we found them to be actually very important in the overall success of the program. But um, yeah, we didn't really go into any sophisticated analytics. We kind of just did a bit of um, touch and feel and went into it with having discovered that there was a common poor performing area amongst a lot of programs and they were in, in various faculties, but they seemed to be an issue and nobody really felt that they had the authority, maybe is a, is a good word, to, to delve into that because the people offering the program were in a different faculty and they were quite closed. And obviously if it's poorly performing, they're quite defensive. And so going in and using a supportive process, we're coming to support you in what you're doing, was a very good opening to, to go in. And, and we found that it was in the end very successful. So, um, yeah, we, we didn't really use any other selection criteria. Thanks. Okay, thanks for that insight. Uh, we experience quite a bit of the same. Um, and when you start off with the module reviews, because it's not a self-selection, um, the, the lecturing, lecturing team or lecturers um, sort of feel like it's... Um, an attack on, on them or on the module. And it's really framing it in a way that this is to support you um, in the way that you teach and providing resources and so on for you to be successful and for the module to improve. Um, what we also heard from many lecturers is that um, their focus is on the teaching and, and learning. The institution's focus is on the module pass rate. Um, and, and often there might be a, a disjoint in terms of the, the way that these things are viewed from a managerial perspective versus a, a quality of teaching and learning perspective. So it is um, being sensitive as a facilitator of these module reviews uh, for the 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 arguments of the lecturers and the lecturing team and uh, the, the management side, which might consist of the HOD and the deputy dean, um, and, and, but also the executive and the improvement of module pass rates at, at, a, at the macro level, if you like. Um, so also touching on the point of um, when you have these service modules, we did not bring in the... Um, let's say the lecturers or the management from the other faculties or other programs. But we did, when we found that there were issues in terms of students, for instance, performing poorly from programs in other faculties, those are the type of issues that we would raise at our student success committee because the, the deputies were sitting on that committee. And then through that process, we would then, uh, have additional meetings and discuss these issues. And there were quite a number of changes that were implemented based on those uh, reaching out discussions with deputy deans from other faculties uh, and how their students are performing in a specific module. So typically, uh, for instance, it would look at, um, is this module, let's say it's a BSc module and you have students taking it from another faculty. Um, is this module as it's been designed for a BSc context, full BSc, is it appropriate for students from faculty X or from this specific program? And uh, what happened in a couple of instances is that a, a more targeted module, a stripped down module, 
was developed for that specific program so that the students could get what they need from a, a BSc a module, um, which is appropriate at that specific uh, level or whatever it might be. So those interactions, those discussions are very important. And you as a facilitator of these module reviews need to have the big picture in mind and know how to, well, no is not the best word. You need to facilitate and arrange those cross over the border uh, relation, uh, conversations so that you're able to make an impact on the module itself. Um, are there any comments or questions from uh, any of the other panel members, group members, um, before we move on? I see I did select this as where we want to stop, possibly. Um, are you still okay to continue? I can just do the next slide and following on that would be going into uh, the survey items itself. But before I do that, any comments or questions from anyone else? See, there is a chat, let's see. Um, okay, so that's from Vanessa. We also face reluctance from lecturers who value their uh, learning and teaching autonomy. I do not always welcome centralized approaches. The approach you describe is essential to incentivize participation. Any under ideas on incentivization? Now that's a good point. We don't incentivize uh, any of these module reviews. Um, I think the inherent incentive is um, firstly the resources that one gets as a, as a lecturer and the lecturing team. So yeah, you get dedicated support um, in terms of getting data, getting support from the instructional designers. Obviously, it's their job to do that, but they have a different approach in terms of providing support more holistically. Whereas now it's a targeted approach at the module level um, based on the pertinent needs of that uh, lecturing team. So I think that's uh, from a resource perspective. And sometimes there's also additional funding for um, uh, uh, funding for tutors and so on. Then um, I think also as an outcome is um, improved module success rates, which is what the, the management and so on would possibly want to see. Um, and then also maybe improvement in terms of teaching and design and also a self um, improvement from, from the lecturing side. So I think those are um, possible incentives that need to be highlighted when you have initial discussions with lecturers. I see a comment here from Cornel Postma. Some academics view such approaches as a, a perverse incentive to pass students to avoid scrutiny. I, I agree. Um, where, and I'm not going to share examples. Um, maybe highlight a hypothetical example, which might be true or might not be true. Um, but where we see people or lecturers that want to get out of the hymns list and maybe um, uh, play the, the, the game in terms of uh, passing students. And I think that's what Corne is uh, alluding to. So yes, that is unfortunate. But I think uh, as, as a lecturer, the noble side, and there's the argument uh, to what extent are people inherently noble and good and so on. But let's say we want to, to, to focus on that is that we want to um, support lecturers to develop their teaching um, and to be able to be vet, better facilitators of student learning. And I think that is from a um, module review perspective, which is where we start from the beginning, um, mid and supporting the lectures, how we want to see the module review. So it is viewed differently, that's for sure, but that's how we actually want to see it. 
These are at WSU, we are at the initial stage of developing tools to conduct module reviews. The session will help us as to what we need to consider in terms of criteria and what to do after the data is available. I hope to um, provide you with some of that information. What I'm trying to focus on is making module reviews the norm at the University of Pretoria. So it should not, it could be a, uh, a, you know, we've got high touch modules and we want you to please participate in this, but I want to try and make this the norm where it is centrally available, a lecturer self-select in that, and that becomes part of their portfolio of evidence um, in order to not only um, through the promotion channels, but also use that as, as a way of them inherently improving the module at a continuous or on a continuous basis where we have this notion of the scholarship of teaching and learning with a continuous action inquiry framework. We provide the data. Uh, there is also data generated through their own surveys and through student feedback surveys that are um, provided throughout the module. So that's where I would like to take it. And that would take this punitive uh, thing, hopefully away, um, but let's see um, if, if that actually works or not. So that's also a novel idea, but good intentions are always, um, not always, but sometimes not appreciated. Okay, colleagues, I see it is 10 past 10. I am going to put us on a forced break now. Uh, I will see you at uh, 10.30. We will start 10.30 sharp. So uh, we can have a body break, get some tea, and then we will move over to the next section until about 12 o'clock. I think we should finish on 12 or just before that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Elias. Kornai Posma, I see I uh, did not see your hand. I apologize. If you would like to still comment, you're welcome to do so. Um, you wrote the part in the text. If there's anything else, otherwise I'm going to continue. Uh, you're welcome to, to type a, a message. Um, let's see. Uh, Okay, thank you, Kornay. Um, so we're going to continue, colleagues. So just referring to in Mbisa's comment here. So now we've got the data. We know which student or which modules fit in the category that we have or that you would select at your institution. Now what now? So if you look back at the process that we were to follow, is that we have now convened this meeting uh, with the um, lecturing team, as well as with uh, the HOD, as well as uh, the deputy dean in some instances. And this is where we now do the module review. So the next part would be to look at what are those components of the module review that we, uh, that we look at within the context of our course analytics framework, obviously. So these are the components. We look at the curriculum. This is the module curriculum, but we also take a bit of a perspective in terms of the program in which this specific module um, or programs, let me say rather, um, that this module is, is a, a, a core module or an elective or a fundamental. It's usually a core module and to a lesser extent, uh, an elective. Okay, then the assessment, teaching and learning. Uh, we look at the students, various components there, communication, support services, and then the policies and the practices. Now, as I said, we had these two approaches that we followed. The one was pre-COVID where we invited the team to a discussion around the table. And whereas uh, with during uh, COVID, it was uh, online and we use the Microsoft Teams uh, as a platform for that discussion. Now, 
both work sort of equally well. It is nicer to have people around the table. Um, I think it is a, a nice open discussion and uh, you can see so many behavioral things uh, which um, uh, enrich the communication. Uh, whereas we, you won't be able to see that as we have it now uh, online with this workshop. It would be better if, if we're sitting around the table and having this discussion on how to do module reviews. Then there's the low key version, which is the survey part. Right, so the survey looks like this. It is in the Microsoft Teams. It's exactly the same as those questions that I have in the, one of the workbooks in Microsoft Teams. And we're now going to go into each of the questions that we have and just look at um, what we're asking there. And here is where you're welcome to, to raise your hand. I'm, I'm going to try and see if I can um, manage looking at the who's raising their hands or not. If I'm not seeing your hand, just unmute yourself and may, maybe make a comment uh, that you want to make on a specific point. So this is what we've been um, asking and trying to understand. But the purpose of this is, first of all, to understand the, the design of the module in its micro parts, but also in its bigger part and how it fits uh, within a program prerequisite so that policies and processes and practices are taken into account in this module review. Um, the, the heading of this, this webinar is basically to look at a course analytics from a data approach. Now, it's, this is also data, it's qualitative, but it is the important part because this is going to uh, give you uh, the key indicators to what type of data you actually want to look at from your management system, your student information system, or your learning management system, and so on. All right, so let's look at the module curriculum. Provide a brief overview of the purpose or aim of the module. Now, to a large extent, here at the University of Pretoria, that information is in the study guide in the yearbook. So they could just copy and paste this. But in the discussion, you want to look at the details of this module uh, in terms of its purpose and its aim. Does it fit um, in broadly what it's supposed to do? But let's also look at the students from the various programs that take this specific module. Does it fit within that? Um, that as well. So is, is there an alignment? Okay, provide an outline of the themes and our units that are presented in the module. So you want to get a breakdown of these themes and very importantly, the order of those themes. In um, one or two of the modules that we reviewed, the order of the themes were placed in such a way to accommodate one of the guest lecturers time. And through that discussion, we actually came to the conclusion, but that's one of the areas that um, are, uh, are actually causing students to not be successful in the module because they, that section is key for their prior understanding, for their understanding of things and concepts to come. So we changed that and um, uh, obviously a couple of other things as well, but that played a big role. And you need to understand those themes and quite often that becomes a blind spot. It's a practical arrangement, but it's not, a, a, it's not conducive to students' learning. List the most important learning outcomes for each themes or units of the module study guide, so you can see that detail. Provide a breakdown of the notional learning hours required for the themes and our units of the module. Again, from the study guide, there is a bit of an Excel resource which, the, which we can use to look at the various components. How many hours are you expecting students to, uh, to spend outside of uh, uh, online or um, in on-campus uh, teaching, the practicals and so on? And is that realistic? Um, so we have had uh, situations where we cut a couple of themes within a module because it was just a, an overburden and overkill 
um, in that specific module. Uh, but obviously that needs to go through a process. It's not just something we decide and it, it gets cut and everything. It goes through the faculty boards and uh, there's, there needs to be a motivation on that. And it needs to show that students still uh, do what they have to do and so on. But it has happened. Are there redundant module content and or learning outcomes in the module? And that's exactly what I'm talking about. Um, please list the modules that are highly related to your module. These may be preceding or succeeding UP modules. And if it's a first year module high school subjects. Um, when we talk to lecturers from first year modules, one of the first things we hear is, well, students come to us unprepared from school. They don't have um, the, the uh, ability to comprehend what we're saying, their language skills are poor. Uh, if it's a, a more scientific or mathematical related uh, module, they do not, they're not prepared in terms of their prior mathematics um, uh, abilities and knowledge and skills and so on. And we work from that base when we, when we have our discussions and our module reviews. Um, but you want to know that um, very often also um, there's a discussion around prerequisites, requirements uh, from other modules. And we've had uh, situations where we change the prerequisites, uh, modules that were not prerequisites to the module under review were made prerequisite and others were dropped based on the module review. So you really want to get students if it's uh, a second year module or a second semester module or third quarter fourth quarter or whatever to know that these students are prepared the module that uh, is under review might not be the, the key um, uh, or the the root cause of the students uh, performance in that module it might be a preceding module and then one needs to have that discussion with the uh, lecturers and the lecturing team from the other module. And we've had that as well. So that's why we have in this module curriculum, it's looking at the details within the module, but you also need to look a bit down the line, either backwards or forwards and see what is the influence of uh, various uh, aspects and to what extent are students prepared, sufficiently prepared and what do you need to do in order to change that. So that talks to uh, the policies and processes there as well within the module and curriculum. Before we move on, do we have any comments or questions on this um, section? Vanessa, I'll take that's an old hand. Okay, it seems like an old end. Cornet, I see your hands up. No, it's a new end, thank you. Um, I think this approach is good and it should be followed for all modules, not only for high risk modules. So, so um, and to gather that data that you are saying, and it should happen like annually, maybe not as extensive for all modules, but uh, I think that would be important if such an approach can be established right through, through the university as part of the quality assurance. In health sciences, it's very important with, um, for us because we have to ensure that this, the students are ready to serve the public. So the Health Professions Council are looking over our shoulder. So we are trying to do these things. But for me, a, a module with 100% pass rate may be equally problematic as compared to the a high risk module because if you're just passing students willy nilly because you don't want to have scrutiny, then there's also a problem. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and that's well, my pipe dream to have this as a, a standard process at the university, the module reviews. But let's see. Okay, so um, thanks for, for the comment, Cornei. Then we can move on to. The next one, let's see if it flips over. Come on. All right, so teaching and learning, the questions that we have here. S sorry, sorry, I've had, yes. I had my hand up. Can uh, you sorry, go I didn't see. The, 
I will okay. go back to the previous slides. You're yes. Welcome. What Please I want to name. my name is Mongi Lendazi. I'm working at Walter Sassoul University. Uh, the question that I have here is that <clears throat> in this brief overview, in, in light of, 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 of students that do not want to pay to, to buy books for whatever reason, how, you, how do you deal with them? Because if I analyze correctly what you have put in front of us, you are saying you are giving the student a way forward in terms of how to navigate for the full year. Now, students will find that in as much you have given them, do you also give them notes or you attach notes to this module uh, review? I'm sorry, to this, to this uh, what is it called? Study guide or whatever you call it. Mm -hmm. Because I can see here that you have the brief overview, you outline the themes the, and the outcomes that relates to the themes that you have. You break down the notional hours, a redundant module, whatever. What I want to know, is there any content that you attach there? When you do this study guide, you give them to say, if I'm dealing with economics, economics, I would be, uh, you give them a study, yeah, uh, some, some, some sort of notes to say, in economics, this is the what you are going to be covering, butter trade. Butter trade started a short summer of when butter trade did it start and then how it, it evolved to the current econo e e economics that we have at this particular point in time. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure it's, whether you yeah. can get my feel. Yeah, no, I, I think I understand what you're saying. So let me just clarify first in terms of what I mean by the study guide here. This is information that should be on the study guide and you're asking uh, or stating that additional information should also be on in the study guide. And if it should be, um, for instance, the literature that they need to uh, use in order to um, go through the module. So it's basically the content that they need to learn. Um, so yes, our study guides, and I'm not going to talk about study guides here in, in detail, but when we get to the teaching and learning uh, side, it is, um, we going to talk is that information given to students and then also discussions around that so when you provide the study guide to students do you provide everything that we have placed in the template so the template would have a section there in terms of what is the content that students need to navigate through in this module four themes one two three whatever it might be and then is this textbook a online textbook or not? And um, there a discussion could be, um, so if it is a hard copy textbook, are there additional or other forms of um, textbooks that they might be able to use? It might not be even a textbook or a set of videos or whatever it might be that students can use to uh, enhance their learning. So. That is when, you, when you're in the discussion and you are at the teaching and learning side, which is the next part, where you would have that, uh, it's part of your teaching design. So as part of your teaching design, you need to look at these various aspects. And this is not an exhaustive list of questions by no means, uh, but it opens up a discussion, the points of the discussion. And very often when you have that discussion, the lecturers would uh, bring this up. And if you have a focus group with the students, they would bring up, but we just don't know where to get this resource or this resource, uh, let's say it's an e-textbook is, is um, uh, I don't know, maybe too expensive or uh, it only shows parts of what we need to have. It's not like the, the full textbook, which is a hard copy. Right, so that's, I think, the best that I can answer. Does that answer the question to some extent? In fact, I wanted to know whether in the, in the study guide, do you give them summary of each topics that you're going to be teaching in the classroom? 
and then for the sake of those students that cannot be able to have, for instance, here with us at WSU, very few books that you can be able for students to get online. They depend largely on the books, hard, hard copies. Now, when students say they do not have the hard copies, what I wanted to know is that, do you make notes for them that are in the learner guide? Do you make notes for them so that even if they do not buy the book, they've got something that they can be able to use that is in the, learn, in the study guide? Mm. Um, I'm going to give uh, Dolph Jordan uh, the option to, to comment on that. But before I do, it depends on the lecturer's uh, teaching design. Obviously, they need to provide information of the books that they're going to use. If there's additional notes on that, that could be placed on the learning management system. Dolph, would you like to respond? Yes, thank you. I think the, the question alluded to more um, domain specific um, uh, ways of providing content to students. Now, in our context, the study guide is, as it indicated, it's just a guideline. It, it, in many cases, and I think in 99% of the cases, it will not include any content. Uh, as John Court indicated, content are either provided through class notes on the learning management systems. Um, the, the, the printing of content has declined significantly at our university, specifically since COVID. Uh, but I fully understand the question where it's coming from to make provision for those students who, who really struggle. So content is either provided in class notes, it is either uh, uh, subscribed in, in textbooks or eBooks uh, to students. So just to answer your question, the, the practice of providing content in, in hard copies, um, well, it's, it's not a practice. I think it could not be provided since uh, COVID, for example. So yeah, it is domain specific and it differs. Thank you, Dolph. Um, thank you. I'm going to then um, move on. So in terms of the review on the teaching and learning aspect, we want to know how many lecturers teach the module. The service modules, obviously, um, well, normally 99% they taught by a group of lecturers. And what is that teaching experience academic level uh, qualification and student feedback on teaching survey, which is a student uh, survey we give to students to um, measure to some extent the satisfaction of the module and so on. Um, with that, we want to see if there's any specific support needed, uh, development support needed from the education consultants to some extent. Um, but it also it gives you an understanding of who's teaching what part. Then uh, describe the teaching design. So this is the important part uh, of the learning activities. Um, and with this teaching design, as well as how the curriculum is set up, is where you start getting an, a feel, an understanding and a feel for the type of data that you want to present about the module. Um, and that is the data that you want to highlight um, so that you can start uh, monitoring and uh, monitoring students' progress and making tweaks and changes to the course content or to the design. Then this is uh, uh, the study guide. Is it clear on the course content, teaching mode, assessment opportunities, module outcomes, um, and this notion of what, what is uh, the content and the books and so on that you're going to use. Um, in the case of team taught modules, are the learning activities of the module sequenced in such a way that it fosters learning? Key concepts come to mind here. Yeah. Um, so is there something that you need to know before you can, students need to know before they can move on to the next theme? And uh, just a discussion on that. Um, is, is very important. All right, and then are there sufficient teaching resources available? Finance, human, time, we know that is in very, uh, very scarce. 
and to what is what extent is that optimally used. Um, so here we try and see if we can provide tutors or whatever it might be, just an, as an example. Right. Then um, we go over to the assessment part. And here you want to see as part of the teaching design, the, the assessment strategies, if I can call it that, um, that the, the, the lecturing team use in order to um, determine if students understand the work and so So that formative assessment part, getting to the assessment, or to, the, to the summative assessment. And then using those and that information in order to make changes and tweaks. So a breakdown of the calculation of marks, assessment types. Um, you can use the study guides as the information of that. Briefly explain the procedure for designing, setting, moderating, marking, and so on of those tests and exams. Often, um, well, maybe not often is the word, there are cases where um, teaching assistants are used. Uh, our department trains the teaching assistants. So we just want to see if there's a need for additional training of teaching assistants for uh, assessment types which have not been used in the past, for instance that there needs to be training in order for them to market and um, all that stuff. Are the assessments aligned with the learning activities and the intended learning outcomes? So that uh, alignment between teaching, learning and assessment. Do you assess the knowledge and skills of the students at the beginning um, of the module? So continuous formative assessments. Um, and then, Asking them quite pertinently, do you actually use the information from continuous formative assessments to design your teaching practice? Um, lecturers are often content specialists and uh, education consultants and ID support with translating the continuous formative assessments into adapting design of, of the teaching. Okay, then uh, what we get often from students is um, the feedback from assessments, the timeliest feedback of assessments, and we, had, we asked this from the lecturing team as well. Uh, are there memorandums, first of all, and then also um, the, the timing and so on of assessments. There are modules where memorandums are not provided, and um, we talk about the, the practicality around that, for instance, and the impact or the um, uh, outcome that might have on student success. Okay, then is there regular training on methods of assessment to staff and so on? Are assessment procedures and the weighting assigned to assessments clearly stated in the study guide? So we want to know that students understand how they are going to be assessed, when they're going to be assessed, and how that relates to their grade point average at the end. Okay, then student engagement is also important. Uh, briefly describe how your teaching, how your teaching design or learning activities facilitate student engagement. So it's a reflection of their teaching practice on students' engagement. And it could also relate to students' attending of class, attending of tutorial sessions, depending of practicals. Um, right. Then um, we also had a, at one point a, a survey that we sent to uh, students. We made use of the Free State um, Boosie, uh, no, not Boosie, the Classy survey. We have um, an adaptation of our own survey that we can uh, use, that lecturers can use. Um, to see if students are engaged and possible reasons for non-engagement. Um, then are students generally prepared with the relevant knowledge and skill required for this module? So a discussion around that. And some of the, they need to list, well, if it's a survey, they need to list it. Otherwise we talk around the prior knowledge and skills that are required for this module. Um, and is there an environment where, which students perceive, that students perceive to be su supportive? Um, you know, we, 
we have discussions around this. Sometimes we pick it up in the student feedback surveys. And um, so you, you really want to have both voices. And if you do pick that up, it could be a follow-up meeting on this specific point. And is attendance required for success in the module? It's very, it's sometimes a, a smack in the face type of question um, to lecturers. Um, it's not to be facetious in any formal way, but it is. So are you actually adding additional value to and value in inverted commas, also not to be a sm another smack in the face, um, to just providing the content of a textbook or uh, videos. So is it important for students to attend class? What are they going to get there? If we have at the university, the notion of preparing for class, you have what happens in class and then consolidation of the class. So within these three steps, sort of, you want to design your activities that students prepare for class. Within class is where you deal with the issues and uh, the additional things that um, add the value to the preparation stuff that you gave. And then consolidation, the student needs to consolidate afterwards. And that's the revision part and so on. Okay, and then is attendance monitored? It isn't at the University of Pretoria. I don't know if it's monitored there, but um, sometimes it is done um, uh, informally, if you like, when we use clickers in class or um, online, if it's a collaborate, it's just Blackboard's collaborate like a Zoom session where the attendance is monitored there. And that could be used as, as early warning uh, indicators as well. Okay, then support services. Uh, this is general support services, but also the support that you provide within the module. Could be from teaching assistants, it could be from tutorial sessions, it could be consultation sessions that you have, but it is a discussion around that and um, how that takes place. Does it support learning? Uh, remember, this is a, a qualitative source of information. And then obviously the, the contact details of advisors and that type of thing. Is that available in the study guide, for instance? So do you put this up front where students can see this? All right, and then lastly, from the structured survey is, um, are there challenges with time tables and the presentation of the module at off-campus locations? So it's a very detailed or very direct question. We have, because it's a service module, there are oftentimes timetable clashes. So students from a uh, program X in a different faculty has difficulty attending the module on another campus um, which is far off and um, they are unable to attend on time. Um, so that's the type of things that at a very practical level, we want to try and sort out. Just as an example, we had that in the health sciences where students from Hatfield campus have to go to Prince of campus, which is the health sciences campus. They have class before this specific module and they would also always get there late. Um, and we attempted to change on one or the other in that we were successful in one or two cases. Uh, on other cases, we had to make other uh, type of arrangements. Then also, for instance, just practical stuff, like we have uh, lecturers from the Faculty of Education, which is at the Groenkloof campus. They need to present the module on the Hatfield campus. They drive from there. They have a module at the um, before the module they teach here. And when they get to the Hatfield campus, there isn't parking. So they struggle to get parking. And now they're riding around, they can't double park. So we arrange dedicated parking for them um, so that they can just come, stop, get out, do their class, and then they're off to their campus again. So that's a type of practical stuff that also impacts on module success. Um, 
might, it might just be a small part, but um, you need to keep that big picture in mind when you're looking at the policies and the practices. Obviously, practices like prerequisites um, are things that are important here. Uh, exam uh, guidelines, that type of thing is also uh, uh, that you need to take into consideration. Uh, another thing that we found um, important, do we have many students repeating the module that have uh, returned due to appeals? This is a reality. I, I think it's a reality at most institutions where um, students have, um, they failed the module, so they're contributing to the poor module success rates, but they have extraneous is that the word um, circumstances so it is circumstances beyond their control beyond the control of the lecturer that contributed to their failure and they go through the appeals process they are then awarded back allowed back into the module to continue with their program that really impacts on the module success rate and we have taken that up to the TV committee and discuss that at that level and also to the appeals committee to look at the criteria at which students are allowed back into the uh, into the module and the institution then um, and to sort of fine tune those so that we're able to support um, the lecturers that they don't feel well students are not making it they have reasons that might have been out of their control or were out of their control but now students are repeating three four five six times and where do we start drawing the line and those discussions help us and also the fine tuning of the criteria to to help the lecturers in that way as well but also to help the students indirectly and do you have many students that deregister the module before the exams this is also a big problem here, and I guess at other institutions. So when students feel that they are probably not going to make it, they deregister the module. That has, if they do that before a specific time, it has no effect on their grade point average. They do not have to pay for the module. Um, and we've actually seen that it has a big effect on the module pass rates because as it's calculated um, is that those deregistrations are added to the module failure rates and the lecturer or the module is actually penalized in that way so we've actually firmed that up uh, for 2022 or 23 it is in the uh, general regulation so students are not able to make any changes uh, before date, whatever it might be. And that means that it's not going to affect the, the module pass rate anymore. Right, so this is the structured uh, questions that we have. When we have these discussions, obviously other things also pop up. And I have a other section in the, the teams and that's where we go there, we capture that information and that becomes part of our um, information set and we work through that throughout the module make the tweaks what type of data do we need and so on so that brings us to the next section and before we get to that section are there any comments or questions i see a comment matope uh, time students spend meaningfully on tasks yes you're you're absolutely right um Okay, so if you don't mind, I think we should continue. So this brings us to the data analytics for decisions. You need to understand the module design, the teaching design, how it's set up in terms of um, its activities, its themes, the assessment practices, um, and uh, determine what type of data you need. And that is my question to you. Are there two or three people maybe that want to venture into what type of data would you need? Or what do you think you would need? Dolph, you're not allowed to answer. 
John Claude, but there's one comment I think which you missed um, Did I? about the whole concept of uh, engagement, student engagement, and then the follow up uh, comment there about uh, sharing the information with students and not only with the lecturers. Okay, okay. So, what is the definition of student engagement? So, it's a very broad definition. It's not the one uh, necessarily of KU, the one that University of Free State um, uh, proposes. So it's a very involvement. It's it's more like the Tinto type of perspective where it's the involvement of students, active involvement uh, online, uh, in class, um, attending. So attendance could also be part of the engagement. They attend tutorial sessions. They are active in tutorial sessions. So it's a very I have a, a broad pragmatic approach to what student engagement and student involvement is. So I'm not proposing any uh, author necessarily like Ku, for instance, um, but I do that, that obviously is important in terms of what student engagement is. You can actually use the book, uh, which is called Student Engagement Techniques, a handbook of college faculty where you can look at when you have discussions with the um, lecturing team and you talk about action items, how, how do you need to set up various things or various activities um, online or face-to-face -face so that you can get students engaged. And that's part of the, um, the classy survey. When you run that type of survey, um, they would say, well, students are so engaged or not, and then various activities that you might want to do. So that's the student engagement part. Then do you actually speak to the students or are you getting the student information from the academics? Right, very good question. So um, our module review discussions are with the academics, but we've had uh, cases where we had focus group discussions with students where it was really a problematic module. So not only High impact was a problematic module as well. But then we ask them, and I'm referring to them, the, the lecturers in the module, that we administer the survey to the students. Uh, we've got a structured survey or, and or we can add additional questions to what they, the lecturers think they want to ask the students. And we've done that quite a number of times. So we get the student voice through the surveys. And if it is problematic, we do focus group discussions with the students. Um, I've missed it, but do you conduct special student surveys for the module reviews? Yes, so we do, We, as part of our action items, we ask that uh, we administer the structured survey and lecturers can then add additional questions. We use watermark or you can use anything for that matter, but the, the thing about the survey solution that we use, it is integrated with Blackboard, uh, which is our learning management system. So as students log into Blackboard, they get this notification, please complete the survey of this specific module. Then they complete it, the results go directly to the survey back end, and we've got a report immediately available. And that information is then brought up in the next meeting, for instance, uh, with the lecturing team, the module review team, and we can talk about those results. Um, and the HOD also has that available immediately. So as students complete it within that window, it is available. We don't need to wait two, three weeks, months, whatever, for the results to come out and be analyzed. All right. Um, Colleagues, I think in the interest of time, um, um, is there anybody that want to venture what data? Otherwise, I'm just going to go over. I'm just scared we're going to lose too much time. I'm going to keep my eye on the comments if I can. All right, so what do we do in terms of data? As you can see, we, use, we are Blackboard subscribers. We use a software a solution called Pyramid Analytics for the business intelligence, the dashboards, and so on as well. That's to, um, to provide additional, more summarized aggregated data to HODs and deputy deans. Some of you might use a different LMS. Some I've just added Canvas there. Some of you might use a different 
BI system such as Tableau or whatever, or Power BI, uh, it doesn't really matter. It's about providing the data based on the information that you have. Okay, so let me just move on here. So first of all, um, when we start off and before our discussion, and obviously this is the selection criteria, we have the, the data analytics, the data which has been used to select the module. Hopefully we can have this as a standard process so we don't have this. So it's a, um, a lot, as a punitive process. So this is the module pass rate. This information goes to a, a HOD and a deputy dean, and it is departmental information. So these are the modules that a specific department um, services or provides. And um, this is so it provides an overview of the modules with the low pass percentage. And those are the ones that we select. So this information is available to HODs and deputies. Then when we focus on the module itself, now you want to start providing from a data analytics perspective, just a profile of the students that you have within the module. The purpose is to get a feel for the students um, and to, uh, uh, when you go through it, uh, see if there are differential outcomes, if, you, if that is part of the, the issue that you've identified. So you need to have the biographical information, the school information, this bottom one, where it's 2016 to 19 at the bottom. These are school quintiles. So what's the proportion of the students from various quintiles? And um, you can, there's obviously other information as well that you can provide your um, APA score, admission point scores, uh, if there are specific uh, high school results that are important for you and so on. So it depends on what you want. It's not exhaust at all. Then we provide uh, to the module team, the review team, this is, which you don't see towards the left hand side are the programs. So it's a service module and we have the programs. We have the number of students from that specific program taking the module. Then we have the pass rate and we provide historical learn grade information, which is ClickUp data. We call it ClickUp, it's our Blackboard data. The average exam mark for the for um, students coming from these specific programs and the final mark. So here you want to try and understand, and it gives a clear picture anyway of which students from which programs are struggling most with this module. And through your discussions, this is the type of information that we provide the evidence for further discussions with uh, for instance, uh, um, the management from another faculty, right? There are other variations that we also provide um, on this specific information, which I'm not showing at the moment. Then um, one can also look at module correlations, which is this left-hand one. So. You had the discussion in the module reviews with preceding and postseding modules, uh, modules in the pipeline that precede your modules. And here you're providing a statistical uh, viewpoint on how related are those modules in terms of students' academic performance. So if you say this module is important. Uh, let's look at it statistically and see, do students perform equally well or poor uh, as a correlation in these two modules? If they are, and let's say the same type of constructs, um, uh, cognitive constructs are sort of uh, measured in both modules. They both require, for instance, a huge uh, chunk of critical thinking, for instance, or some kind of comprehension. This is your statistical evidence that they are related. So 
it means if x module, let's say uh, whatever module it is, is related to that module, but the one is not a hinge and the other is, then we need to start looking at, okay, so how are, for instance, uh, how is the assessment measured or used in your module versus another module? So it opens up various types of uh, conversations around that. The, the person item map, this is a, it's called the item response theory. It's a type of measurement, Rosh analysis, where we've placed the modules of a program into an analysis. And what you have is um, towards, uh, here you see the module codes. These are dummy modules. They're all dummy module codes. At the bottom end, you have the latent dimension, which is basically um, the difficulty level, which is transformed. I don't want to go into the technical stuff too, too, um, too much. But what you want to see here is if you have first year modules in a program, in terms of their cognitive difficulty, because you're testing students' or modules performance in relation to another module in a program. Is this module more difficult or less difficult than another module? And if it is a first year module and it is equally difficult as a third year module, then it opens up a discussion around, so in this program, where is this module pitched? Should it be at that level? What is the purpose of that module? If it is a gatekeeping module, where you want to um, uh, have students uh, sort of go through the module, and if they cannot make that module, they would not be um, suitable to continue. So you're going to recommend alternative partners if that is the purpose of the module. So it brings you back to what's the purpose of the module? Is that the intention? Is that what it should be? And in this pipeline of, of, uh, of all the modules in the program, should it not be maybe tapered down to uh, maybe a second year level so that you can manage the scaffolding of students' knowledge from one module to the other and within the program that it still meets the curriculum uh, and guidelines and quality and so on for the CHE and so on. So that opens up this type of discussion. So this is the type of information that we can provide prior to the, the discussion or we have our discussion and we see, but this is the type of analysis that we need to do. And then we have a discussion around this and it opens up additional action items. Right, so when we get to the survey results, well, or the discussion, this information needs to be open to everyone of the team so that we can have a look at how this module is designed and is it, um, does it correspond to what is on the, on the study guide? Right, so we provide this, we make it open, and then we have this, side-by-side uh, uh, -side view in terms of, okay, so it's six module credits, but you want them to do this and this and this and this. These are the prerequisites, no prerequisites. But then when we spoke to you, you said, okay, well, this module needs to be there. Uh, there's another module which needs to be at least at a 60 to 69%. There are no prerequisites. So how do we, how do we explain that? Um, and how do we make changes to that and maybe discuss that with um, the line management and so on. Right. The next, the teaching design and activities of uh, the survey. So that's the teaching design. So here we ask, describe the teaching design and learning activities. So now we've got an understanding of how you've set up the module, when will you do your uh, uh, assessments? How many tutorials do you have? Um, is the study guide clear? And so on. So here we have that. And based on that, we go into the learning management system. We've identified the key indicators, of the data that we want to look at and see, okay, so here are the weeks of the module. 
And here we're looking at course accesses versus assessment accesses, for instance. So you've now brought in how you've set up the module and how you've done the uh, assessments and also the content that you're providing to students in preparation for either the module or the assessment. And now you want to check, is there alignment between these in terms of students' behavior on the learning management system? That is at the technological side. If you do not have this as a technology and you do this in a, a class situation, you need to um, determine what type of information do you have available? How can you measure if students have a, a access to content or have um, done what they need to be doing? So it makes it a bit more difficult, but there are ways that you could do that. Um, and then on the, on the right hand side is just the statistics in terms of the assessments um, and the activities and so on in relation to what you have from your module review discussions. Then, as I said, the assessments, um, how that's been set up, the calculations of the scores, and then you want to go into the data itself. And you then want to see if there's alignment between the learn grade, uh, for instance, and the final grade. So that's just at the high level that you want to have a look at that. And then maybe look at what are your grades and how they relate to students' performance. Um, so it's the CIS final grade, they mark uh, as, a, as a letter grade, and their learn grade, which is the formative assessment, the summary of the formative assessment, and the semester mark and the exam mark, and so on. And would you expect, uh, let's say, a CIS grade of a B, that the learn grade would be 74.8%, the semester mark is 65%, and so on. So do these make sense and are they aligned, for instance? Then going into the fine grained detail of various assessments that you had um, in terms of the average grades of, um, of the students in that, there is obviously additional information that you can also look at uh, for instance, the um, more in terms of a normal graph, the standard deviations, do you have many students falling out of the or in the first, second standard deviation? The DCEL to some extent provides that information. But what you want to see is when you have these various assessments down the line and you've assigned weights to those, where do you want students to? Uh, be performing at their best? When should that peak be? Or is it a consistent good performance that you require? Is there a slow growth that you require? Um, and then align that to the resources and preparation and so on that you've provided to students. So bringing all of that information together. Okay, colleagues, um, I've said quite a bit. Before we go to the next, is, um, do you have any comments or questions from your side? Yes, I have Yvette. a question. Sure, Yvette. Yeah, okay. you want, um, yes, Yvette Lope from uh, School of Medicine, uh, University of Pretoria. You want, I was just wondering, how do I get a hold of the data if I'd like it for maybe teaching research purposes, but um, the data of modules that I'm not involved in, if I'd like to correlate data of a different block or module to maybe the, the, the data in my module, how would I get access to that? Well, we can have a discussion around that offline because it's more a, a UP thing. Um, okay. That information is, um, we'll have to set that up through the HOD um, so that if it's a if it's a research project, it, it's different to a business um, um, process, if you like. So, but we can have that discussion offline. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Any other comments or questions, colleagues? For now, let's see. Yes, maybe it's also a UP related um, question. Um, I like very much to use data and I do wherever I can. And I, I 
approaches, but things like pyramids analytics for me is only partially useful because it doesn't cater for our context because students may, for example, have sub minimums that they have to adhere to. They have to both pass the theory and the clinical. And now the average is way above 50, but actually they failed. So pyramid analytics is not able to pick up that risk. So, mm -hmm. um, so it requires a change in what Blackboard can do. And I've got some solutions, but um, I have engaged about this and it doesn't seem to be possible. And then you get to other sources of data like the student feedback system that has been implemented. Again, it doesn't um, cater for our context because you can see the response rates are very, very low. And I understand why it's low, but yet um, there's never been like engagement on my level to to help sort this out, like you are seeking to find solutions on the for the high risk modules, and um, that engagement happens with the HODs, but they uh, are not going to care about it because um, we operate as a school and as a collective, and so it needs to happen on on school level, um, mm -hmm. and we are different from the other schools in health sciences, and and I will tell you exactly why the response rate is so low. Uh, because there are way too many feedback questionnaires sent out at random times and the students are busy studying for tests, so they're not going to respond to the feedback. Mm -hmm. And then on the soft side, when we submit the grade rosters um, annually, we have to put the year mark, the exam mark, and all the marks the same, otherwise it spits out wrong information. So, so because we don't use that Hatfield campus model. So, so I, I would like to use all of these things, but I, I cannot um, because we need to first ensure that the data that we use is is valid, and 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 it may require um, quite a lot of in, engagement. So that's what I wanted to say. Yeah, thanks for that, Corne. We can follow up on that as well, um, because it is a special use case, um, specifically for the student feedback. Um, system. I think you have a representative there on the health sciences um, faculty. But yeah, this is a very UP specific case. Um, but thanks for highlighting that. All right. So moving on, then, is um, you saw in the um, Microsoft Teams platform that we have this set of action items. So the action items could be. Uh, support from the education consultants, uh, or however you've structured your your things at uh, at your institution. The point is that from your discussions, there should be action items. I think that's a principle that I want to put down here. Um, and what those action items are depend really on the outcome of the discussion or discussions or range of discussions as well as from the data, right? So this is basically uh, what is important. In addition, those um, action items could be uh, ad getting additional information such as student feedback instruments. In some use cases, you've heard that not everything works uh, as a default at all campuses at the University of Pretoria and not in all modules. So uh, what is available from a Blackboard perspective, but I think it could be available in other learning management system platforms as well, is um, uh, setting up flags within the learning management system based on your uh, or the lecturer's teaching design. Um, so here you actually going into uh, the things that uh, are important that you want to measure and flag the students that who, who have not met the criteria which you have set up. And then there's an alert. And based on that alert, you can also notify the students or the, the lecturers. Um, and I think anyone which is set up as a, a lecturer or a, um, an assistant within Blackboard. But so that is um, taking the, the review which is the conversation around the survey items and data, and then using that very practically within the module. And that's something that you can also support the lecturers with. Maybe it's not a technology-driven thing. It might be something else, 
um, depending on how um, and what type of resources you have at your institution. And then it could also be um, various uh, online resources that are uh, referred to, which the lecturers might want to use. Um, for instance, here we've got this notion of prepare, engage, consolidate. And um, the, we've got, as you can see here, guidelines on the study guides, various other videos and uh, information which we provide to, to lecturers. So that's basically the, um, the section where we actually have the action items. The last part, and I think it will take us up to close to 12 o'clock, is now this review part. Uh, and that's the last, the last section in this uh, webinar. So closing the review loop. Right. So if you broadly look at this messy picture, it's from understanding the student experience through the last momentum framework, clearing the path to completion. This is typically the pathway of students through a program, navigating their process through all the hoops and regulations and stuff of the university, their experience, their pathways, and they go here and there and all over. So the idea here is to, in, in the module reviews, is also to provide some structure to students within the module, taking into consideration that this is the messy pathway that 90% of the students go through. Some of them have even worse pathways than this. Um, and hence, they do not complete in minimum time, nor plus one or two, maybe plus three. Um, so the idea is to then within the module provide at that micro level, if you like, the structure so that students have the ability um, to, to navigate through the module as smoothly as possible. And what I sort of propagate here is that we take the module review um, into stages and also the review at the end, um, take into consideration the stages that students take through the module. You can, this, you can extrapolate this to the, to the program level as well. I've just uh, adapted this for the module level. So you're looking at connect this first formal lecture what should happen there and what is happening there and to what extent does that contribute to uh, students' disengagement or confusion or whatever it might be. The entry phase, the progress, and then all the way to the completion, that summative assessment, for instance. And below that are policies, practices, programs, and processes in the module, right? So I'm also not going to go too much, well, not much into any of these evaluation frameworks. They are um, specifically the logical framework is sort of the de facto uh, one that universities tend to use, even, even, even in our uh, um, strategic planning, uh, we have a, a focus on the logical framework. What are our inputs, the activities or the processes outputs, outcomes, goals, academic departments, as well as service departments are measured in terms of their outcomes. Um, even if you're a center for teaching and learning, you need to have outcomes. Uh, and to what extent are you contributing to outcomes? Those outcomes are typically uh, student success rates, uh, module pass rates are one of those outcomes. And you need to show what you're actually doing in order to reach those outcomes and what's your contribution to the bottom line or the outcome. Um, whereas the theory of change, I think is more appropriate to the messiness, which is very pertinent within a teaching and learning environment. Uh, for a center for teaching and learning, um, we are able to theorize based on data 
what was our contribution and I think to a large extent within a module that would also be the best way to to measure your outcomes and to theorize on the changes that might have happened based on the uh, action items based on the data and based on uh, all the evidence that you basically have all right so it also uh, this is basically uh, the theory of change to describe how and why you think change happened and then um, also the sort of sentence if we do x so if we do if we did this uh, action item then y happened and then to say well okay this is sort of what we think why this happened all right so in terms of just looking sort of high level in terms of the principles of the theory of change um identifying long-term goals and the assumptions behind the outcomes so it is not necessarily looking only at what you have here in front of you but also looking backwards and looking forwards um very important is this backward mapping process so we've got this outcome we saw a, a change in behavior in students so now we need to look backwards okay we did this this and this and this this was the information and why did that happen uh, it's also voicing your assumptions about what exists in the system which without your theory won't work you need to look at intermediate outcomes and preconditions to those outcomes weighing and choosing the most strategic interventions to bring about your desired change so what were those uh, strategic interventions developing indicators so even if it's not a very structured approach as in the logic framework, they, they are measures, they are key indicators. You need to still uh, look at the outcomes and the um, leading indicators to those outcomes. And then in terms of quality review, three basic questions of your theory uh, based on your data, is it plausible, is it doable, um, and is it testable? So you need to uh, want to try and see if you can replicate this. It should not be just a theory, which is a pie in the sky. It should actually be replicatable and tweakable, if that's a word, um, so that uh, there's this continuous cycle of, of quality enhancement. And then um, writing a narrative to explain the summary. I must say, um, this is a challenge um, in our module reviews. To have this as a very structured approach um, to the module reviews. What, what I did is I asked the um, module team or maybe the um, module coordinator to just write reflective notes on um, what, what were the action items and then what were the outcomes based on those action items as a means or a way of reflecting at least on what happened within the module and um in you know in terms of what what uh what was done what was decided upon what was done what uh, support was provided and then obviously one of the main outcome would be the module pass percentage um and then um, to, sorry, I, I, I was reading this comment now, uh, which I'll respond to now. And then that then becomes the evidence to, um, to the HOD or to the um, deputy dean. So the question here, Linda, who monitors that the action steps are done? All right, in terms of, um, reporting the lecturing team of the module coordinator um, reports to the hod so the hod has the um the the role to monitor that the action steps are done that's the direct line management the deputy dean has oversight my job is to facilitate and to provide the data so in in 
actual fact, it is the HOD that makes sure that these steps are implemented and creates an environment, hopefully, with, where this, um, these action items and steps can be implemented. All right. Um, what else do I want to say? Yes, yeah, so um, the reflection is either just a reflection note from the lecturing team, and I add that to the Microsoft Teams uh, workbook of the module. Um, in the past, we had some of the very high impact modules. They gave feedback as a presentation to our TV committee. And um, the, the action items, as well as the outcomes and the continuous challenges were then discussed there at that committee. Uh, because uh, very often those challenges were out of the control of the lecturing team and the HOD to some extent, and they were cross-cutting issues and they were dealt with at, at a different level. Right, so the other form which I am working on and which I haven't provided is, is to provide a more structured approach to this logic, uh, to the uh, theory of change idea. Um, so again, you need to isolate and focus on each outcome individually. But there you would have a, let's say, a, a structure, a template, what, which one can use to theorize on the change or the outcome and the reason for that outcome based on this information here. So summarize the preconditions or requirements necessary to achieve the outcomes and explain why. So really reflecting on what are really the root causes around this? What do we need as, as preconditions in order to reach this outcome? Describe how and why you think change happened. How did it happen and why did it happen? What are the key elements and features of the module that support the outcome, that led to the specific outcome? What resources are necessary to achieve the outcome? So this is a, a more theorizing around this, more qualitative things that you think as, as the lecturing team, so you need to facilitate this, um, um, as, as a discussion, then you go to the next tier, which is the data part, the activity-based measures. So let's say this is students that went for tutoring have a higher pass rate. You've statistically proved that students who attend tutoring um, do better, taking into consideration that normally your uh, students that don't need tutoring go for tutoring. You've isolated the students that really need tutoring, they've gone for tutoring, and they perform better than a corresponding group uh, of students. So that's been tested statistically. You need to now theorize behind what happened within that tutoring, for instance, and within the bigger picture, why that happened. So the activity-based measures is that you've seen that the number and percentage of tutoring sessions um, that have been attended have increased. So okay, maybe that's one of the reasons. On-time assignment uploads of the tutors, tutor assignments, for instance. Then you want to look at change in attitude, knowledge, and skills, and change in behaviors. Those two are leading indicators for the outcome, um, which is the pass rate. So as an example, students understand the knowledge and skills in the module better. Now you've identified a measure instrument to measure that, obviously, or uh, it could also be a qualitative or a, a focus group where you've had a discussion with students and they've disclosed that, well, based on this and this and this, they understand uh, the concepts better. Then change in behavior, increase in tutorial attendance, or increase in uptake of e-resources or whatever it might be. So those, if you see changes here um, and you've theorized about what's happening, you expect students to perform better. So that's part of your whole um, uh, foundation for the change. Then at the target uh, part there, 
target one, two, three. Uh, those are just examples where you go and look at evidence of changes that you've made within the curriculum specific or within the assessment strategies or the teaching and learning. So you could bring the student engagement there as well, if you, if you like. But it's bringing a, a, a holistic picture and theorizing around that change and then setting that up as your evidence for outcome one, two or three or whatever it might be. Okay, let me see here is a comment from Vanessa. Please talk about governance. Is module review a mandate component of the internal quality assurance? Okay, so no, it is not a mandated part of quality assurance. Program evaluations are, um, uh, that, that, but that happens through the quality unit at the University of Pretoria. So that is a formal process. There are obviously also other uh, program reviews, such as Cornet um, mentioned these uh, HBCSA doing reviews for uh, the dentistry, for instance, or all of the health sciences um, programs. And then obviously EXA at the engineering and so on. So the, these module reviews are supposed to be um, an internal review where you have a internal quality improvement um, and which is not punitive, uh, which should uh, also not be seen as the same way as a module or a module um, or a program evaluation. Then are HODs and lecturers instructed informed which modules will be reviewed in your current year? Currently, yes, that is the way it works. Um, I provide the module pass rates to the deputy deans. We have a discussion around that. The HOD is informed of that. And then the lecturers are approached and said, okay, um, we see there is an issue um, based on the module uh, pass percentage. Let's have a discussion. Um, this is the focus that we're going to have. It's not gonna be punitive. Uh, we're going to provide resources and see how we can help you through this. So um, although it is a top-down approach, uh, our perspective from our center is to provide support for this. Through which governance process committee structures are departments mandated to participate in module reviews? Okay, so it's a bit of a, um, a gray area, but the student success committee is, um, I'm the chair of that, but the, the actual responsible person for that is the uh, DVC academic. DVC academic of all the deputy deans and deans reporting to him. And through that structure, we drive the module reviews. Um, so I hope that answers the, the three questions there. Colleagues, this brings me to the end of the presentation, you'll see that I have um, a number of resources available. Um, are there any final comments or questions or just feedback from your side that you um, want to highlight, maybe perspectives from your institutions? Thanks for that, Cornei. Yeah, it is a it's a massive elephant, and um, it is with quite a bit. Um, I don't see any new hands. I see old hands. If it is a new hand, just unmute yourself, and you can talk. Yuan, Yvette here again. I was just yes, wondering, yes. Uh, do you know any software programs that can be used where you could basically populate all the learning objectives as well as the assessment criteria so that all the lecturers that are involved in a specific module would be able to see exactly um, what has been laid out and the students could get access to that as well, just to provide uh, clarity and where the students could see how the one module or how it builds up from the one year to another. Are there any software programs that you are aware of? Um, I'm not. Dolph, do you know? Um, I know there's a, 
outside. from outside that we want yeah. to do these things electronically. I'm not sure how far we are though. Yeah, so so the only uh, at this stage, um, it's not so much speak to what you're asking for. Um, it more speaks to alignment of outcomes. Um, is a specific function we have in LMS where you align goals um, to activities, but that's not what you're asking for. You're asking for a, um, a repository. Um, and I think our, even our annual yearbooks uh, include at a high level the outcomes of a course and a program, but not at the detail level. These things are residing in a study guide. Uh, so yes, we're also looking for something like that. Yeah, thanks, Yvette. Again, a very uh, UP-specific question, but you're welcome to uh, uh, email myself or Dol for ba basically both of us, um, and then we can put you in, in contact with the um, Head of Education Consultancy. Thank you so much. Um, can I ask, I'll ask UP maybe a specific question? I'm not sure. <laughs> sure. And then I'll go um, to Linda. I see Linda's hand is up. So, yeah, to continue. Okay, thank you. My, my last question is just wondering if you've done any of these uh, module or reviews for um, the health sciences, especially the School of Medicine, just to see if you've had any approach, because you were saying uh, when you address these, you involve the head of department, but for mm. us where we have the basic as well as the clinical departments involved, yeah. it becomes a little bit more complicated, especially mm. because the clinicians have their teaching responsibilities, but as well as their hospital responsibilities. So if you would like to align um, certain strategies or if you want to improve, because I know a big uh, thing that we struggle with is that the assessment criteria does not necessarily speak to the learning objectives. But if you want to make those changes um, to the assessment methods, then um, it also now falls on the clinicians to say, would they have time um, to do mm. all of the marking? I know they are two is involved but mm. just wondering how you bring it together where the basic sciences and the clinicians can um, be more or less on the same page but also being very considerate of their clinical responsibilities yeah that is a good question um, on a very practical level and it, it's sort of um, I'm going to respond briefly though uh, to what Cornet said is that uh, at the health sciences you're performing so well so you are 99.9% .9 below the radar. But we have had uh, module reviews at two modules on the health sciences campus. I'm not going to say which ones. But then um, if, if we make this open to all modules, not as a you have been selected top down, then we can start having these discussions um, and, and looking at the unique context of the health sciences uh, faculty and the modules that you have and the, the challenges that you have with um, clinicians that also teach and their other responsibilities. I think that's where I'm going to stop on that. Um, but yes, uh, let's see how we can do that. Linda, your, your question. Uh, yes, thanks. So my question is, when you're looking at the pass rates as, as your selection criteria, are you looking at historical pass rates or do you have a sort of, an early test um, as soon as the module, because you said it's it's staggered you know, at the start oh, of the yeah. module, middle, end. So how are you doing it? Are you looking at a historically yeah, poorly performing module? Mm, yeah, it's very blunt. Um, we look at the uh, previous year, yeah. uh, but we also look maybe two, three years um, before that year. Uh, but it's, it's a very blunt thing. And I think that's part of um, why we also get a bit of pushback on that because it is so blunt. And if you make it a uh, you know, open process, um, I think it would be much better received. Yeah, okay, thanks. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, colleagues, this brings us to the end. Um, I'm going to save you two minutes. Please, um, the link of the evaluation form to evaluate this uh, presentation, webinar stroke workshop, uh, please use the link and complete the survey. It is, um, I'm also going to look at the data. You will obviously remain anonymous, I guess, uh, Elias. Um, but then I can also use this improve, to improve the, 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 um, the webinar in, in the future.
but from my side, I'd like to thank you very much for your participation and for the opportunity to uh, have presented this workshop. It was a privilege. Okay, colleagues, enjoy your day, your week, your month, whenever we see each other again. <laughs>